Hi, I'm Michael Hush. I'm the head of quantum science and engineering at QControl. What follows is a series of videos originally made for QControl's webinar, An Introduction to Robust Control. The videos are presented by me and Andre Carvello, who is our lead of quantum professional services. The videos work through a Jupyter notebook that is available at app.qcontrol.com. Go there and sign up today for a free trial of the products shown in these videos. Furthermore, there is an exercise at the end of the notebook, which you can try and solve in browser to test your newly acquired knowledge. The presentation is split into three parts. In the first part, we establish the problem, how noise affects the performance of quantum computers. In the second part, we present the solution, using robust control to mitigate the effects of noise on real hardware. And finally, we provide a hardware demonstration using robust controls on IBM Q. Now let's start by looking at the problem. Today, we're gonna to talk about robust control and how it can help improve the performance of your quantum computer. To start, we're going to look at what the problem is we're trying to solve. So I have headed to the IBM quantum experience and I have set up a very simple quantum circuit. This quantum circuit performs a swap operation. Basically, it changes the state from the first qubit into the second qubit. This is often represented as a gate with two X's like this, um, but I have implemented it using the fundamental gates that the quantum computer can actually do, which is individual qubit gates and C0 gates. At the beginning of the circuit, we take the zero state of the first qubit and apply a NOT gate to turn it into a one. So if I was to write down the state, the initial state is zero one. After we apply this quantum circuit, we expect the gates to swap. So the final state should be one zero. Now that I've made the circuit, I'm going to run it on a simulation and on a real device. Let's have a look at the results. Let's first look at the result of an ideal simulation of the circuit. Um, after applying the X gate, we prepare a state which is zero one. So after applying this operation of a swap, we'd expect to see one zero. As you can see, when we look at the histogram, the circuit was run many times and every single time the state returned one zero. This is the ideal performance of this quantum circuit and what we would normally expect to happen. Now let's have a look at running that same circuit on a real device. First, we can confirm that the circuit that I programmed is the same circuit that is actually run on the physical hardware. As you can see, our individual qubits are replaced with these U3 gates, which are just local operations, but the C0 gates are in exactly the same place. Now, when we have a look at the results, we can see that they are quite different from the simulation. We still get a one zero state with the highest probability of around 72%. But occasionally we get incorrect results, including a 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. So why is our quantum circuit producing wrong results when we run it on real hardware compared to a simulation? The answer is actually noise. Uh, to better understand why, let's have a look at, our, at the same circuit using the QControl's Black Opal visualization feature. Here we are in the quantum circuit visualization feature of Black Opal. I've set up the same quantum circuit that I had in the IBM quantum experience. Let's have a look at what happens when I visualize this quantum circuit when there is no noise. Here we are showing the dynamics of the quantum computation as a function of time. Each of these block spheres represents the state of the quantum qubits, with the top of the block sphere representing the zero state and the bottom of the block sphere representing the one state. Here we can see when we run the circuit with no noise, the qubits finish in the final state we expect. The first qubit is in a one state with pointing down, and the second qubit is in a zero state pointing up. We can also see the correct path the qubits should have followed if there was no noise. In particular, there's no entanglement generated in this circuit. This is because each of the entanglement tetrahedra in the middle of the diagram all remain zero. Now let's try and turn on some noise and see if there's a difference. Black Opal allows you to visualize two different types of errors. One is if there's a miscalibration on your control amplitude or how fast you apply your pulses. And the other is for an ambient background dephasing process. Let's turn them both on and see what happens. We can now visualize the dynamics of that circuit with noise. Here we're plotting both the state of the qubit and also the correct state if there was no noise. As the simulation continues, we can see that entanglement is being generated in the tetrahedra in the middle when it wasn't in the first case. Most importantly, at the end, we can see that the final state of the qubits is not quite on the bottom of the block sphere or the top of the block sphere as we were expecting. Now, 
when we actually measure the final state of the qubit, it gets projected onto the z-axis. Because our qubits are not precisely on the bottom and top of the block sphere, we will start to get incorrect results. So instead of only receiving one zero, we're going to get zero zero results, one one results, and zero one results. This visualization shows that if there is noise occurring as we run a quantum circuit, it will produce the wrong result at the end when we try and measure the state of what these noises are doing and how to fix it, we need to look at just an individual gate. For the rest of the presentation, we're gonna focus on that first gate in the circuit, an X or not gate. Let's first have a look at what happens when I have a control amplitude noise on an X gate. Here we can say that as we rotate the qubit, instead of going from the top to the bottom as we expect of a not gate, we go a little bit further than we should. This is because the control amplitude has been possibly miscalibrated or is randomly changing each time we try to apply a gate. Because of this slight mismatch, we end up missing our target state. And if we repeat this kind of error through multiple gates, it can add up and result in the final state being a long way off what we intend it to be. Now let's have a look what happens when we turn on ambient dephasing. Once again, we are trying to rotate from the top to the bottom of the block sphere. But because the ambient dephasing creates a slight rotation around the z-axis, as we're going from the top to the bottom, we end up missing the bottom of the block sphere by a little bit. We now have an understanding of how noise affects the performance of a quantum computer and how it can mess up the final result. In order to fix this problem, we need to design different types of controls which are robust to these noise processes. I'm now gonna show you how to set up a simulation of an X gate with this kind of noise in Boulder Opal. And then using that foundation, we will develop some robust controls. Now that we understand what the problem is, noise on our quantum computer, we want to create a solution. To do that, we're going to use Boulder Opal. Boulder Opal is a cloud-based software infrastructure product which can be integrated into your quantum computer using Python. Here we have a notebook which shows you how to configure and run Boulder Opal if you're trying to design a robust control. We are going to consider a single qubit undergoing dephasing noise. This model is a realistic representation of what would happen with a superconducting qubit if there was a stray magnetic field around that was creating a noisy dephasing process. We first write down a Hamiltonian, which explains how the controls and noise affect our qubit. In this case, the Hamiltonian is made of two terms. The I modulation comes through with an omega I as a function of time, which is multiplied by a sigma X operator, and the Q modulation is represented by an omega Q as a function of time and comes through with a sigma Y operation. We are going to try and achieve a not gate. The way we're going to do it as a benchmark is we're going to turn off the I channel and then only apply a drive along the Q channel. We're going to apply this at the maximum Rabi rate for a duration of pi over that maximum Rabi rate. This will ensure that there'll be a total rotation of pi. The next part of our Hamiltonian is the noise part. We are going to consider that there is a stray magnetic field that is affecting our superconducting qubit. This is best modeled as a stochastic process eta that is multiplied by the sigma z operator. The stochastic process eta is sampled from a noise spectral density which obeys a power law. The precise nature of this power law will depend on the magnetic field in the background. Q control actually provides an additional set of tools which can be used to characterize noise spectral densities like this. Picking the right noise model is essential when designing a robust control. We have a variety of different example notebooks which are available on docs, which show a whole bunch of different systems and different noise models that are appropriate. Also, you should always come and get in contact with us. Just contact us on intercom or send us an email and we'd be more than happy to talk, more than happy to talk through what system you're working with and what the best model is. Here is a plot of the particular noise power spectral density we're going to be using. This actually follows a 1 on F power law, which is quite common for magnetic fields. As you can see, with a spectrum like this, you tend to get very low frequency noises that dominate. That means that the actual noise itself will look approximately stationary throughout the duration of the gate, um, but will tend to change over long periods between gates. Now that we have a Hamiltonian that describes our quantum computer, and explains how our qubit is coupled to the controls and also how it is affected by the noise, we can perform a simulation. I won't go into detail how to set up a simulation of Boulder Opal, just have a look at the simulation feature guide. We'll spend more time talking about how to actually optimize a robust control later on. 
But let's just skip down and look at the actual simulation results. So here we are plotting the coordinates on a block sphere of a knot gate. So we're actually doing the rotation about the y-axis. So you can see the x changes from a zero at the top of the block sphere to zero again at the bottom of the block sphere, and then it rotates around as it goes through. Uh, the z coordinate, which is basically the, the height on your qubit, it starts at the top with a one and ends at a minus one. The thick line is the ideal simulation if there was no noise. And you can see it here, it actually starts at the top of the block sphere for the, uh, for the zero state, and then we're flipping it down to the bottom to produce the one state. There are a whole bunch of dotted lines also plotted. These correspond to each individual one corresponds to a different noisy trajectory. So each one can be, you can be thought of is a different time you've run your quantum computer. It's particularly evident in the Y plot. We can see that the noise is creating a significant difference between the final state of the ideal simulation and when we add noise. To get an understanding of what the average quality of this gate is when there is noise, we can have a look at the average gate infidelity. The average gate infidelity is calculated by taking a whole bunch of stochastic simulations, as I showed you before, and averaging the distance, which is done as an overlap, between the target unitary we're trying to achieve, the knot gate, and the actual unitary that was achieved with that particular simulation. In this case, you can see that when we average many trajectories, we end up with an average gate fidelity of 0.0032. If you combine many gates in a particular quantum algorithm, the number of these errors are going to accumulate quite quickly. It can be difficult to figure out how a particular control is affected by a noise, especially when it has different spectral features in its noise spectral density. To get a quick understanding of the quality of your control in terms of its robustness, we can have a look at something called a filter function. A filter function gives you an understanding of how sensitive the control is to noise at different frequencies. The filter function is defined as the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the noise operator in the frame of the control field. The noise operator in the frame of the control sounds complicated, but basically what it's telling you is if you were moving along with the state of your qubit as the control was applied, it would tell you the current direction that the noise is being applied. With this definition of the filter function, it's possible to prove, assuming the noise is small, that the gate infidelity I introduced to you earlier happens to approximately be equal to the integral of the noise spectral density multiplied by this filter function. This indicates that the filter function actually tells us how much of an effect noise has at different frequencies. We can calculate the filter function using bold oval. If you want to know more details about this, go have a look at the filter function feature guide. Here we can see the filter function of the standard knot gate we simulated above. You can see that it is flat for low frequencies. This indicates that if we have noise at low frequencies, they will have a negative effect on the average gate infidelity. Not only can this filter function framework be used to understand how noise affects particular controls on a qubit, we can actually use it to optimize and design robust controls. That's what we're going to have a look at next. We have established the problem. Noise on a quantum computer interrupts the path of a standard knot gate, and this results in a bad average gate infidelity. Now we will create a solution. We will design a new robust knot gate that is immune to the negative effects of the noise. We can design this pulse using the optimization feature in Boulder Oval. The optimization feature essentially does a search over lots of different candidate pulse shapes until it finds one that max minimizes a quantity we call the robust infidelity. The robust infidelity is a number that quantifies how close a particular candidate pulse is to the correct operation and how robust it is. It, it is made of two parts. The first part is the control infidelity. This quantifies how close the gate made by the candidate pulse is to the target gate. When the control infidelity is zero, the gate made by the candidate pulse will be correct. The second part is the noise infidelity. The noise infidelity comes from the filter function framework. It is essentially the filter function value at zero frequency. If the noise infidelity is zero, then we can be confident that any low frequency noise will be strongly suppressed and not affect the gate infidelity. Hence, if we can find our candidate pulse with a robust infidelity very close to zero, it will implement the correct gate and be robust to low frequency noise. Programming Boulder Opal to find a robust pulse is simple once you've written down the control Hamiltonian. The optimization feature just requires that you create a graph that relates the pulses you are trying to optimize to the controls and noise on your qubit. 
I've mostly created this graph for the problem we are looking at now, a single qubit under dephasing noise. And I'm gonna go through it step by step. I've written down the total Hamiltonian again, so it's easier to refer to. As we put together the graph, we're basically rebuilding the control Hamiltonian and then separately the noise operator. The first part that makes up that control Hamiltonian is the omega i. This is basically our pulse that we're trying to optimize. I've created a function above which makes it a bit more convenient, but basically we provide it with the total duration that we want to apply the pulse for, the number of segments that make it up, the total, the maximum rate rate that can be achieved, and also we give it a cutoff frequency to ensure it doesn't change too quickly. This pulse ends up being defined as a piecewise constant function where each segment of it has an amplitude and a duration. I create two signals, one for the I part of the modulation and one for the Q part of the modulation of the microwave drive. The next thing we have to do is connect how these signals actually affect the qubit. In other words, we have to multiply them by an operator that operates on the Hilbert space. I've already written down the code for writing down the omega i times sigma x part. We create a piecewise constant operator instead of a piecewise constant signal. This takes in the signal that we had before and now an operator, in this case being the sigma x. Coding the operator that connects the q modulation signal to the sigma y operator is very similar. Let me just copy paste this and put it in. The key things we have to change is we give it the name q instead of i. And now we need to also connect this pulse Q here as the signal. And instead of having a sigma X operator, which you can see in the Hamiltonian up here is what it is connected to the I, we change it to a Y operator, which as you can see in the Hamiltonian is what is connected to the Q. The last step in creating the control Hamiltonian is then to simply sum these operators together. The noise operator in this case is quite simple because it's not related to the control signals. All we have to do is create a constant piecewise constant operator with a sigma z as the operator. We have constructed our control Hamiltonian and our noise operator. So the last part, last part is just a simple function to create the robust infidelity. The robust infidelity takes the Hamiltonian, which is our control Hamiltonian, also the noise operator as defined above. You can have multiple noise operators, so we allow it to be a list. And lastly, we also define the target unitary. In this case, we're trying to do a not gate. So we put the target operator as that target. To complete the graph, we then use the create graph function. This combines all of the results above together and all it needs is its definition, which is provided through the infidelity. At the end, you need to be able to define what information you wanna get back after the optimization because we not only need to minimize this robust infidelity, we also need to find the corresponding pulses which implement that robust pulse. Above, we can see I gave both the I and the Q pulses a name, I and Q. So all we have to do is then provide those I and Q labels back to the graph. Actually running the optimization is then one more extra step. You simply take the graph and use the Q control services to do the flexible optimization. And all we have to do is provide that graph that was constructed above. This then spins up a whole bunch of servers in the cloud, which simultaneously search over a whole bunch of different candidate pulses and find one that minimizes that robust infidelity. It then returns that one robust pulse um, and provides you the cost that was returned. Here we can see the optimization was run and the cost we got was 2.5 by 10 to the minus 11. This is very, very close to zero, which is in indicates that the pulse both cr creates the correct operation and is also robust. If you run an optimization and your cost is not close to zero, it's most likely that the particular constraints you have are too constricting and the optimizer is unable to find a good cost in the search space. To give it a better chance, you should consider increasing your constraints. One of the key ones is increasing the duration. As you can see here, we have a duration which is three times as long as the standard duration of a not regular not gate. This extra time is needed because creating a robust control is much more complicated than creating a standard control. Now that the optimization is completed and we found a low cost, we can plot the pulse that was found. Here you can see the pulses for the I and Q modulations. As you can see, it, the pulse is made up of a set of small piecewise constant segments. This is typically what you end up needing when you're programming these pulses on a real signal generator. The other useful feature here is that we have added a bandwidth limit. So you can see that these pulses are very, very smooth. Uh, this is particularly important when implementing these pulses on superconducting qubit hardware, which tend to need uh, tight bandwidths on their pulses. 
we can now investigate and confirm that this pulse does the correct operation and is robust. First, we can have a quick look at its filter function. I'll skip the details on how you create it and just look at the result. Here we can see the filter function for the robust gate we just made suppresses noise at low frequencies, as it has a very, very small value when for frequencies less than 10 to the power of two. The final test of this robust control is then looking at a full simulation with this noise model. Once again, you can have a look at the simulation feature if you want details on how to create the simulation. I'm just gonna skip straight to the result. Here we show a simulation of multiple trajectories of noise on a block sphere. As you can see, the state no longer moves on a simple straight path, but rather a bendy one because the pulse we're applying has a more complicated shape. Nevertheless, if we look at the trajectories, unlike before, when at the end, there was a significant divergence between the dotted lines and the solid line, indicating that the noisy trajectories were not ending up in the correct place, we can see here that they all happen to reconverge. And the final state after the noisy simulations is actually very, very close to this, the simulation if there was no noise. We can further confirm that the robust control is indeed robust to the noise, but having a look at the average gate infidelity. Here we can see that the gate infidelity when we use the robust control is significantly better. The standard gate had a robust gate infidelity of 0.0032. The robust gate on the other hand has an average infidelity of 0.003. This is over an order of magnitude improvement. We have successfully used Boulder Opal to design a pulse that is robust to noise. We have verified that it works by looking at a filter function and a simulation. But one final question is left. Why on earth did it work? To get an understanding of this, we can move to a geometric picture. During the optimization process, we minimized the robust infidelity. A component in this robust infidelity was the filter function at zero frequency. It's easy to show that minimizing that value is the same as minimizing the integral over the total duration of the pulse of the noise operator in the control frame. You can think about the noise operator in the control frame as basically what the direction is of the noise as you're moving along in your control. If the direction of the noise happens to integrate to zero, that means that if there was any noise which was slowly changing as you were moving along, it would effectively self-cancel. We can see this explicitly by looking at a graphical representation of this noise operator in the control frame. This operator happens to be traceless and Hermitian, so we can represent it simply with three numbers corresponding to its overlap with the Pauli matrices. In this plot, we've plotted the noise operator in the control frame. As you can see, as we move along, the noise is changing the direction. Initially at the top of the block sphere, the direction of the noise is entirely in the Z direction, but by the time we're halfway through the pulse, the noise has completely moved in the X direction, and now there is very little noise moving in the Z or Y direction. The key thing here is if we look at each of these plots, the area above the curve is equal to the area underneath the curve. This means when we integrate each of these lines, they will all equal zero. This ensures that if there is any random noise at the beginning, no matter what direction it is in, it will effectively self-cancel as we complete the operation. This is why sometimes this effect is called an echo when talking about dephasing with a qubit. At the start of this presentation, I also showed that it was common to have amplitude or control noise as an issue on quantum computers. As an exercise, you should try and design a robust control for this problem as well. Let's now complete the loop. So I start this talk by looking at this quantum circuit, and we examined its performance when running in an ideal simulation versus real hardware. We noticed that noise was creating an issue, and the results were sometimes wrong. I then showed you how to design robust controls with Boulder Opal for an individual gate. In fact, I showed you how to design a robust control for that first gate, the X gate in this algorithm. If you're able to then do drop-in replacements where you design robust controls for each of the gates in the algorithm, you can ensure that each gate will be robust to noise and hence in the end, you will get a better result in your final calculation. Next up, Andre will be giving you an example of how we have actually implemented our robust pulses on real hardware at IBM and seen significant improvements. Welcome to the final part of our robust control webinar. In the first part, you learned what robust control is and also to design and create your own pulses using Boulder Opal. What I'm going to be showing this last part is the demonstration of the implementation of such pulses uh, in real hardware. So for that, we'll be using uh, the IBM cloud quantum computer, but I'm not going to be showing 
specific details of the calibration of our pulses or how we deploy them in the machine, this is going to be left uh, to a future webinar. So in a way, this is going to be more like a teaser of uh, what's about to come with focus on the main uh, results that we get with the real implementation. So let's start with the situation where you have your circuit and you want to send to the machine and, and we want to analyze a little bit of what's going on under the hood. For that, let's focus on a single gate. So let's get that X gate that's there in your circuit. And when you look at the system, what is actually sent to, to the hardware to implement that gate, it is actually a microwave pulse, which has this form here for the full IBM gate. So this is actually what is sent. And if you look at your full circuit, we are going to have lots of these instructions, a lot of those pulses going on across the device. What we also learned today about the robust pulses is that we first need to identify what we want our pulse to be robust against. So let's look at a little bit more carefully with what happens when we send this gate. So we have this X gate, which ideally would be this pi pulse, this rotation from the North Pole to the South Pole of the blosphere. And <clears throat> when we code that into the system, we use Qiskit so that we send that pulse into the machine. And when we look at the final result, the final result is actually uh, a bit off with respect to what we would expect. This is because the actual quantum computer has real hardware limitations. Those machines are extremely uh, hard to build and they are sensitive. So that's, that's what we have in the end. If we look at this figure at the bottom here, the lines are the Q control simulations for what the square pulse would, would do in the system and the circles are the results. So then we see the errors around here. So in our experience with, with those pulses, what we saw is that one, of, one important source of error is really miscalibrations or fluctu fluctuations or changes drifts of these calibrations around the day. So, what we have is actually that those errors in real machines are usually quite small. They are hard to see just with one application of the gate. So what we do is actually we apply a sequence of gate repetitions because they are more sensitive uh, to these errors. Let me just perhaps show this in a browser. If I go here to Black Opal where I can just visualize the dynamics in the block sphere. If I have in my circuit this X gate here, and I'm also selecting a control amplitude error, so errors in the uh, amplitude of the pulse. If I play the dynamics here, what we see is actually, so the green dot here is the known error trajectory. So that would be the noise free dynamics. And this is where we would end up because of the error. So as I was mentioning, this error is small, but we can see that if we have a longer sequence here, actually what happens is that the error accumulates, so showing that this kind of repetition is actually sensitive to amplitude noise, and that's exactly what we'll be using. So let me come back. to my slides. So this is the kind of repetition sequence that I've just shown to you in Black Opal. And we designed uh, an amplitude robust pulse using the, the method that Mike, Michael showed you earlier today. And it's interesting to actually look at the dynamics of this pulse in the blosphere. So I exported this pulse uh, to Black Opal. I can show you uh, if we go to our product here. So what we show here is the dynamics of that optimized pulse in the blosphere. Has this quite interesting dynamics and you see some symmetry here as well. You can see the dynamics uh, happening again. Also in it's interesting to kind of go back and see the, the filter function. That's also something that Michael uh, talked about today, and we see that for our robust pulse, we really kind of suppress noise at low frequencies, uh, noise for, for the control in the amplitude part of this pulse. So let's get back to the, to my slides. 
And what we have here using this pulse, we implemented actually in the machine. And what we have, here's the result. So on the horizontal axis, we have the number of repetitions of this sequence and the different lines corresponds to the results applied to different qubits. Um, in the system here we have, we apply in the back end that has five qubits, that's called Valencia. So the gray shaded area here is the area between the best performing qubits for the default gauge and the worst performing qubits. And what we see is a huge variability from qubits to qubit. When you look at our amplitude robust pulse, what we see is that first it is above the lines for the, uh, the four gate, but also that they are quite bunched together, indicated, indicating that the error across the device is really kind of tight enough. Uh, so this is summarized in this right plot where we plot the effective rotation error per gate, which is basically extracted from this first plot by looking at the transfer probability after the full uh, repetitions, 250 repetitions, and we compare with the initial transfer probability, and we see how much we decayed and divided that by the number of gates applied. So this gives the effective rotation error, which is first smaller than the average for, for the default gate, and most importantly, the variance is much smaller as well, indicating that we, we are able to homogenize the error across the device using this uh, robust pulse. So we managed to then improve the gauge fidelity, also we reduced the qubit variability, and at the same time we reduced performance drifts as we can see uh, in the next experiment. So what we did is that we perform a calibration of our pulse on May 18th, and then we use that calibration uh, over the course of four days. And what you see here from May 19 to May 22 is that the average across the device for our pulse remains quite stable, although you see that the variance is increasing a bit, probably indicating that it is time to do a recalibration after four to five days. The gray points here are the four pulses and those pulses they are calibrated daily. So those results are actually the results of the pulse that were calibrated on that day in that machine. So despite the fact that we are using an older calibration, our robust pulses are still performing better uh, over the course of days. So finally, the, the final example that I want to show you is really the example of parallel gates. What I showed before is really sequential gates where we apply those X gates on each qubit individually and analyze the performance uh, in that scenario. So what we can envisage doing is performing all those gates in those different qubits at the same time in parallel. But when you do that, you would expect that these gates may just affect all the qubits. If you look a little bit again, uh, again under the hood, when you look at this simultaneous application of the X gate, what's happening internally is that we have five microwave pulses being sent to the device. And if you look at the configuration of the Valencia back end, that's the one that we've been using, you see that the qubits are actually interconnected here. And one could expect that when we apply a pulse in qubit one and qubit three, for example, that because they are coupled, there could be some sort of influence between uh, from one pulse into the other qubit. So that's what the crosstalk means. And in fact, what we observed is really an impressive stability of our robust amplitude pulse, even when we apply them simultaneously. So the dotted lines here are the, are the previous experiments where we actually send those gates individually on each qubit. Now the triangles correspond to the default gate applied simultaneously. So this shaded area here is actually the how much worse the gate gets because we are applying them in parallel. So this is basically uh, illustrating what the effect of the crosstalk is in those qubits in these gates. And what we see is that this uh, solid line, which is our parallel implementation, remains pretty much on top of the previous one, showing that it's pretty stable and doesn't change much, even though we apply these gates simultaneously. There is, for qubit series, slightly different. We see here that we all pulse actually got a little bit worse as well, but uh, 
we see this kind of variation uh, sometimes in some of those qubits. But the important uh, aspect here is that overall, our pulses really remain uh, is stable across the device, even with parallel implementation. So what I showed with this kind of short presentation in terms of the implementation is that designing those robust pulse really uh, help uh, improve the performance of those cloud computers. We improve gate fidelity, achieve homogenization of errors across uh, the device. We actually reduce the amount of calibration that we require because of the stability of those pulses uh, as compared to the default ones. And on top of that, we also are able to achieve high performance gates in parallel because we can reduce crosstalk with uh, these robust pulses.